Hello and welcome to the Airline Business Podcast, discussing key news and trends in the global airline sector. This time, Michael O'Leary ready for group role at Ryanair, troubles mount at Aigle Azure, and six months on, the MAX remains grounded. We look at what faltering air cargo demand and slowing passenger capacity growth means for the market, and at how Vietnam Airlines is positioning itself in one of the world's most dynamic aviation markets. My name's Graham Dunn, and I'm joined here in the studio by my airline business colleague, Lewis Harper. Hi, Graham. How are you doing? Yeah, good, good. We're um, slightly different to normal practice. We're uh, recording this before the magazine goes mm. to press, so right in the... Um, right in the middle of press week. Right in the yeah. middle of press week. So which stress is... levels are, are higher than usual. <laughs> yeah, so this means that, on the one hand, we're closer to the subject, because mm. we're busy writing it literally as we speak on the other hand uh, things might have moved on by the time mm, <laughs> it actually yes, gets yeah. there yes well let's see <laughs> and it's been uh, you know i think over the last few weeks as, as you suspect during the the summer months it's usually quite quiet a lot of uh, the stories that have been um, dominating the headlines beforehand sort of carry on strikes have been uh, certainly in the uk have been um, one of the big topics and uh, british airways is, is just uh, the pilots have been on strike as, as we speak uh, one of the stories we've been following very closely has been uh, ryanair in terms of that that succession because succession plan because um, mm. uh, michael o'leary you know so much associated with the carrier and, and he's not going anywhere but he has got a new role yeah, so we knew back in February that Ryanair were moving towards this um, IEG style structure where kind of O'Leary would eventually step up and take on the Willie Walsh style role. So, and yeah, a couple of weeks ago we got kind of confirmation over who would be kind of becoming the CEO of the main line as a result of that, and that's Eddie Wilson, the um, Ryanair's chief people officer. He's a, he's a Ryanair veteran, has been there a long time. Um, so yeah, yeah, um, but we knew this was coming. But um, it's obviously uh, a really interesting moment in in Ryanair's history, um, and it'd be intriguing to see really what how O'Leary kind of presents himself from now on. And do, would you <laughs> would you want to have O'Leary as your boss <laughs> when <laughs> he was he used to be doing your job? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> I would I would imagine he'll still be, be closely yeah. closely watching it hands on. Yeah. Um, I suppose within that group, obviously you have. Uh, Ryanair is still, or the, or the the classic Ryanair is still the mm. uh, the primary, uh, you know, by far the largest part of it. Uh, you have the emerging loud emotion business. Yeah, you've got Buzz as well, the um, Polish leisure the, uh, carrier, and obviously mm-hmm. Malta Air, that, that um, relatively new new operation. Um, so it'll be interesting. I, I don't know. Um, there's a lot to play out in this structure. Obviously, it's still early days, so they've only just made that announcement on 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 O'Leary's kind of replacement on the main line but um and we t- you just mentioned strikes it's interesting it'd be interesting to see how they use those units in the future um obviously um whether they'll have more of their you know main line stuff maybe moving it within those units where i just got in mind that the trouble they're having with strike action and everything mm. and how they might that might play out um but yeah it, it's certainly an intriguing time i mean wilson himself is a interesting choice um just when we look at the C-suite across the, the biggest airlines, it's very unusual for a chief people officer to to step up into mm. a, to lead an airline. I think probably a key point on this one is that um, Wilson has obviously been at the forefront of a lot of the negotiations with with unions. So, and that has been the biggest challenge for Ryanair in the past few months. So, I think he's very much a logical choice from that point of view. But at the same time, unusual because um, when I did that recent survey of the C-suite, there wasn't a single um, airline in the top 100 that, that where the CEO had stepped up from, from that role. So, yes, yeah, so there is an unusual, and as you say, I think the, you know, that entire journey that, that Ryanair has been on and it's been mm-hmm. uh, painful at various mm-hmm. stages um, with its with its staff and then the union recognition after the pilot rostering uh, challenges. And Eddie Wilson has seemed quite a central mm-hmm. figure within that. So you, you could see the... Um, yeah, and the, the the other interesting angle, which is still playing out, of course, is Peter Bellew and as the chief operating officer. Um, I think last I heard he's still employed by Ryanair, but obviously he's moving to EasyJet to take on the same role. So um, there's a bit of turbulence around, around that at the moment, so that's still to play out. And obviously, chief operating officer at Ryanair is, is, is a, yeah, in, in as much as CEO is very important, clearly... Um, keeping the, the operations ticking over day to day is, is absolutely critical with these strikes going on so I'm sure that it'll be really interesting to see who 
moves into that role as well um, when that when Bellew's situation is eventually resolved, I think. Yeah, and I think you know going forward, we'll certainly look at one of the interesting things will be the extent to which Ryan maybe uses that model to to better position itself in terms of. Uh, mm. Possible acquisitions, or, or mm. and then like, the, certainly the way Ryanair has acquired things is it's tended to be lesser, and not just Ryanair. Actually, I think we've seen this across Europe, where the low cost carriers have perhaps tended to buy an asset, a, a particular base. You know, mm. and you saw that with EasyJet buying the Berlin Tegel operation of Air Berlin, where you know some of the carriers that become available in one form or another. Mm. Um, yeah, like I might look to buy particular segment sectors of it rather than mm. than the whole business. Mm. And you know, I think Ryanair's group structure obviously makes that easier to 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 bring in additional. Bring in, yeah, and the other advantage you look at um, IEG with its big aircraft orders, for ex- for example. Um, obviously, an intriguing thing with Ryanair at the moment is the louder part of the business is an Airbus operator. So. Um, so yeah, they're kind of different disciplines within that setup as well. But certainly in the future, I guess you would be looking to Ryanair placing, getting even more ordering power. I guess when they come to place those aircraft orders with with a whole group of airlines that they can they can supply. One possible player that might be uh, on the market in some form or another, um, which is which uh, is a new story that has emerged in in, in recent days, is Aigle Azur in that. Mm. French leisure carrier based in uh, uh, Paris Orly, mm. and um, I sort of knew this would happen because I just finished a piece uh, <laughs> wrapping up how how the uh, the kind of uh, uh, start up and failures mm. uh, of, of carriers had been over the summer. Wasn't um, your conclusion as unlikely there'll be any more? You'll be no, yeah, yeah. yeah. The, <laughs> I had happily uh, led on uh, that there had been. Um, Mm. It's been relatively quiet, which traditionally in, mm. in the summer months is what happens. You do tend to see o- over the summer, um, but that's obviously where, especially in, in places like Europe, that's where airlines make the most of the majority of their money in those, mm. not unsurprisingly, in the busy peak travel periods. And the winter becomes tougher tougher for those airlines. And, and obviously we saw quite a few airlines uh, falling by the wayside last winter, especially in Europe. Um uh, but anyway, there's, there's the start of September. Uh, Aigle Azur emerged as, mm. as a carrier with some challenges. That, that's right. So they've gone this bankruptcy. Um, I don't think they're, they're operating at the moment. But as you just touched on with Ryanair, as you were saying, um, I think it's going to be an example possibly where we see there's there's value in certain assets at the carrier. So I think the latest reports is there are 14 um, interested parties, not necessarily in buying the airline as a whole. And I think the key point you mentioned, Paris Orly, I think one of the, the biggest things is um, is the slots that it has there. Um, so um, I, the impression I get is unlikely to you know, carry on as a going concern as, as Ego Azor, but, um, but certainly there's some um, big interest. There's rumours EasyJet. Um, Air France, KLM have definitely said they're interested. Their share price dropped, interestingly, after they um, announced that. But, um, but yeah, it's, it's very much an example of a fringe carrier there that's got but it's got some some value you can see the strength of paris markets are they've all traditionally been quite difficult for carriers to get into to get mm. the the access to uh level is another uh player player at paris all the klm efforts klm because transavia has operations mm. there so there's a lot of um uh elements on it i mean that'll be one to watch yeah. um they're an interesting carrier because of the, the shareholders that were already in Azur, which was yeah, it's a curious one, wasn't it? And it's another example, maybe where H and A Group we we know um, it's d- difficult really to get a full picture of what's going on there. We, but but probably another example of they were forty nine percent shareholders in in Azur, so uh, an, an example of one of their investments that that struggled again. David Nearman was thirty two percent investor. Uh, curiously, uh, I think he holds a European passport mm. because obviously as a European carrier. Um, you wouldn't be allowed to have over forty nine percent foreign ownership, but um, which and, um, and Neilman, of course, is involved with, uh, uh, who's the founder of of, of Azul in Brazil and yes, uh, and JetBlue, yeah, yeah. um, but is also involved with TAP uh, Portugal. Yes, it, it, exactly. So, um, and I think it was um, part of the the trouble they've had in recent recent days has been the, the um, one of the French shareholders kind of trying to make a move to to take um, take. Um, control of the mm. carrier and that's obviously um played out with them um, entering bankruptcy but um so yeah a, a curious some um, kind of ownership set up there for a lot of interest for what is a relatively small 
you know, carrier. Mm. But and in 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 recent months, they kind of moved into um, longer haul markets. So um, Sao Paulo, they were flying to, for example. And I think there's an impression that possibly they've overstretched themselves there, and um, mm. and that 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 kind of hasn't worked out. There's certain logic, obviously, with the, the Azul tie up through Nuneman to to do in that, mm. but um that that hasn't um played out as well as they'd hoped. So that'll be uh, another one we'll be watching develop over the over the next few days. It's obviously a fast moving story, so um, mm. uh, <laughs> by the time you <laughs> listen to this, who knows who'll have invested in Ryan them or what, them, what will have yeah. happened, but 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 we'll see. Um, a sort of, I guess, uh, a longer playing story and one we've been talk- talked about, you know, because there's no avoiding it, uh, is the Max and uh, the grounding of the aircraft, and of course, um, uh, on Friday. The, this coming Friday, Friday the thirteenth, will be mm. um, will mark six months of its um, mm. since since the aircraft was grounded by the US um, regulators as well, and it remains a challenging story, doesn't it? It, it does. I think when in the early days, very much uh, looking at the uh, the impact on the fleets as they were as the grounding happened. What's obviously happened the longer it's gone on, and it's um, see a, a key milestone. It's reached six months because. At this point, you know, a, a lot of those carriers would have been expecting more Max aircraft to come into their fleet. So it's affecting um, their plans, certainly now going into the winter. And if it goes on much longer, that's that's going to extend and into next year. Um, yeah, well, one example we, we spoke about previously, but Ryanair, of course, were mm. were due to take their first uh, Max aircraft in, in April and have already talked about um, mm. uh, Possible base closures and that slowing of pace for ne- uh, for next year, and citing uh, the Max. Exactly, uh, yeah. And a lot of the uh, the US carriers have been um, fairly vocal on pushing back the uh, the re- return of the Max into the their operating fleet. So um, so yeah. In terms of well, it's six months in, in terms mm. of whether there's an end in sight, we um, Boeing have, are talking about the fourth, fourth quarter of this year, um, but. At the same time, um, there's still, I think, some regulatory hurdles to to overcome. You know, forgetting about the 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 kind of um, consumer concerns around the, the, the Max. I think we heard last week from Patrick Key, um, Director General of the um, European Union's Aviation Safety Agency, mm-hmm. um, talking about how they still need to be reassured on on several points um, because. And we talked. You mentioned the FAA. Mm. I think um, obviously a key thing that's happened since the Max grounding is is um, there's there's been a move away from the automatic kind of re-regulation of um, of, of aircraft. So in the past, the FAA, FAA would say this this aircraft's good to fly, mm. and kind of the others would kind of fall into line. What we're seeing now is like EASA as an example saying, actually, we, now this has happened. We're we're sceptical about your processes, and we're going to do our own investigations. It's a sort of, uh, it's an, a, a, there's a sort of inevitability, mm. of the, or it's an inevitable consequence, I guess, of the manner in which the aircraft is grounded, and almost, you know, unrelated mm. to the Max itself. That it, it felt as though um, the processes would be when you had different. Um, uh, regulatory bodies in different regions and countries saying it is safe to fly here, it isn't safe to fly there. Mm. Um, it, clearly, in terms of, of restoring faith or restoring that process, this mm. is going to be there's a, that's an additional hurdle which, which it Boeing's is, going yeah. to face. And EASA's investigations, because of that concern, went beyond just the, the MCAS system. So they've identified several other areas where they had um, concerns about the aircraft at the same time obviously uh, there's um you look at china for example their aviation safety agency amid this kind of spat with the us and there are all sorts of other factors that, that may influence how how um how the agencies respond so i think um um yeah we're 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 some way off kind of getting to the end of that one interesting aside is that um southwest said a couple of weeks ago that they will be retaining the max name um for when they're presenting the schedules to their customers um that their their impression was that um the customers would have faith that the uh, the airline would have um would have done yeah, the the due diligence, due diligence and would would be um would be confident to fly on that basis so um that's interesting i think i've said before it it seemed unlikely that the, the optics of kind of trying to hide the fact these were max aircraft mm. was probably um probably not going to work i think 
you know, my my, my view is we're, we're likely to see that that um, at least initially customers will need to be reassured that they know what they're flying on. So plenty still uh, ahead for Boeing. We'll be looking at uh, some of the impacts that the max grounding has had and those other wider geopolitical issues that Lewis mentioned there in uh, part two. Don't forget you can subscribe to the Airline Business Podcast using your app of choice. Welcome back. And um, for us, even though this isn't the mid-year point or midpoint of the year, I mm. forget the right, right way around, the summer months always give us a bit of a time to reflect a bit on, on how the market's sitting, how things are developing this year. We've been looking at a couple of areas which give us a few clues. And um, Lewis, you, particularly you've been following air cargo a little bit mm. and the developments in that market, which, I mean, air cargo has been in the doldrums and then mm. it was... Um, you know, a much happier story, mm. uh, but more recently things have turned again. They have so. So in the kind of two years up to the end of uh, 2018, it was kind of a good news story that you know after um, after some challenges, particularly in the you know, the aftermath of the um, the global financial crash. But yeah, there, there was a strengthening really in the sense that, and and just to say, obviously, the air cargo market is kind of often seen as a bellwether for the the wider economic situation so but then around november kind of 2018 things turned um and uh, iartis figures show that since then um freight freight ton kilometers so essentially demand has been down i think every month since then so generally around the sort of between two three four five percent sort of area at the same time capacity has, has been going up and obviously this capacity incorporates the capacity you would have in the belly of passenger aircraft yeah so, i mean it's probably worth 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 saying yeah. that cargo or freight operate or in terms of airlines operating their freight traffic they have slightly less less control yeah. over um uh, over because you have the, you have your freight business and then you also have um mm. uh, capacity that is added so if you have a growing passenger business mm. uh, and increased belly capacity available in that you mm. you sort of have more capacity whether you see yeah. You you can't necessarily control. No, you can't, and um, and yeah, that that is an important point. I think, and and certainly another point around that is that if you look to the US, for example, there is a kind of split in the market. Certainly, where if you look at some of the dedicated cargo operators like Atlas Air, mm. um, ATSG, who would lease to, to kind of cargo operators, there's kind of they acknowledge a split. Where if you look at the global freight market, so internationally, mm. it really is struggling, but. But certainly where they, you know, Atlas Air, for example, who operate, and ATSG as well, both operate Amazon services, so delivering kind of e-commerce delivery, mm. um, that, that's actually doing quite well and is a kind of, um, but it's obviously not affected by the same things that are affecting the international market that are really uh, are dragging on on those revenues, particularly for a lot of the carriers who do have a big cargo element to their services so essentially we're looking at the, the big kind of legacy network carriers in particular um so and the the key context of this i guess is the is partly the the general slowing in the, the global economy so um naturally that will have an impact on on how much international freight there is but something that's really affecting the market badly is the uh, u.s china trade spat and the the impact that's just having on trade flows between Asia and, and North America um, and you know several commentators said that that actually hasn't fully played out yet in the, mm. the air freight market so they've kind of seen the, the initial reactions to that and that actually things could get a bit worse and certainly if you look at the comments of Alexander De Juniac, IARTA's director general um, they're, they're pretty strong saying this is you know pretty very tough time for this this freight market and and generally, this yeah, we've got Brexit as well. These kind of um, measures that that kind of tend to isolate countries rather than keeping them open to trade um, have a very real impact on that that air freight market. And again, Brexit won't have played out yet because it hasn't happened, and we don't know what form it will happen or when it will happen. But but um, but certainly, um, I think there's a concern there that 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 this could get worse before it gets better. Um, and just to give a very stark example of this air china and it's um i think across the first half of the year reported cargo revenues um down 44 percent year on year so it's that that's one of the more extreme examples but 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 certainly um there are very few carriers who are seeing um, any kind of growth in 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 that market so it, it is a challenge um and 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 especially for asia asian carriers which mm. is 
uh, makes up the largest uh, proportionately. Uh, yeah, I think capacity was around thirty five percent of the the global market, and that they are you know they're, they're kind of leading those uh, the the falls year on year in terms of the, the demand. Yeah, certainly, and and yeah, mo- a lot of commentary does does say that that is a result of what is seen as increasingly kind of protectionist mm. outlook from 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 governments. Um, so you, you'd expect maybe to see some of that playing out in the in the financial results of mm. of Asia carry, Asian carriers in particular. So that provides mm. a bit of a, a, a drag in there. But then obviously there's this a precursor to a wider um, economic challenges and a wider fall in demand, which would obviously precisely think. yeah. I think what what the concern would be, I guess, is that at the same time as this move into you know the, the most indicators show that the economy is slowing globally. Um, at the same time, if you throw into that this trade spat, um, you know, carriers will be going into what if it eventually becomes kind of a, um, a recession in some countries or, or regions, they're kind of going into that on on the back foot, really, mm. with um, with the situation as it is now with cargo. As you say, for a lot of carriers, cargo is a relatively small proportion. I think um, Air China, for example, we're talking about revenue being down 44%. I think it was only around 10 I say only ten percent. That's significant, but it, but it's, um, but it's not, um, not the majority of the revenue. And as you say, a lot of the time they're flying the aircraft anyway because this is belly capacity. Mm. Um, so the, the, the things to consider. But it's, um, but it's, if you're an international freight operator at the moment, um, yeah, no, no one's particularly. <laughs> you won't be particularly happy about how things are going. And and as I say, it, it could get worse um, before it gets better. Mm-hmm. We, we talked about the, how the freight market, obviously, yeah, the capacity uh, has been growing at the same time demand has been falling. Um, the capacity side for passenger services, you, you've been having a look at that, Graham, and yeah, looking at some of the challenges around at the moment. It's definitely, I mean, at a, at a headline level, passenger growth over the summer is is, is slower. It has it has slowed, and you know that's not necessarily unexpected. I think um, IATA and its um, outlook at the start of the year was for. For the traffic passenger growth to fall slightly, mm. to still grow, but to be at a at yeah. a um, lower rate than uh, previously, and it has been growing at above average trends. You know, um, higher than we've seen. You know, in the five, six, seven percent levels, mm. which you know would be higher than you would traditionally see. So, some level of uh, fallback is expecting. We looking at um, some of the capacity data figures uh, from uh, uh, Sirium. Um, they they have uh, a, with their schedules database shows um, that the capacity depending which metric uh, you use whether it's um, uh, if we say seat capacity or SKs growing in that sort of three to four percent margins mm-hmm. and uh, over the summer and that compares to growth closer to six and seven percent over the last four or five years mm-hmm. so you can see at a headline level airlines are are just slowing that growth in a bit, and and it's and it's interesting then to to look at more specific markets as to as to why that's happened or where that's happened, and mm. and there's some interesting stories out there. Um, the intra-European market is is really interesting. That's one which where growth has has slowed uh, uh, very noticeably, mm. um, and again we've had really rapid growth over the the previous two three years. And a lot of it, when you look back to, to last summer, a lot of that was Air Berlin and Nikki and Monarch all coming out of the market. Mm. And competitors could have chosen two things because it was already quite a heated market and they could have decided to to slow it down or they could have mm. decided to, well, this is their chance to take share, take markets. Because they're very attractive markets, holiday markets to you know from Germany, Austria, mm. Switzerland especially to um, um, the Mediterranean. Very, you know, they're good, strong leisure markets. So they piled in, people piled in, they mm. they, they they came in. And I think what you're seeing this year is we, we've had casualties again over the winter. You know, people like Wow Air and mm. Fly BMI out of the market. But but actually, the airlines have, have shown a more cautious approach in Europe in terms of probably consolidating those positions more than they would have otherwise. And I think also aware Lufthansa is one which has very publicly spoken about the need to, to rein back capacity to ensure a, a, 
a higher punctuality or better um, mm. quality of service because, of course, last summer there were so many problems um, in terms of uh, service punctuality, mm. whether that's strikes, disruption, overcapacity in the ATC. Yeah, and at the same time, yeah, I suppose you've got um, a Norwegian, for example, obviously a, d- a decent chunk of capacity in the European market. Obviously, it already had a stated aim to be a lot more conservative this year with what it was doing. And then it's lost, uh, you know, a significant number of Max aircraft out of service. Won't necessarily be that upset about that. I think you may may be better off financially um, getting the compensation for that than ha- having had to run them and having the max, bottom fares for the Max factor yeah. is difficult to work out exactly yes. how much capacity yeah. has been lost by the Max. I mean, obviously they would use different aircraft to fly some of those routes, but. It, it, that obviously is another area of pressure, which you know you you could control a little bit to lever the airlines would have in terms of mm. how much they want to fill it. Nor- Norwegian's interesting as well in that that um, that low cost long haul market, which of course was one which was very um, we were seeing a lot of activity around, and that's one that's obviously been really hard hit mm. by the collapse of Premier, who had a lot of plans around that. Wow Air, who were a strong player in that, and Norwegian has. Has scaled back, has restructured that network as part of its profitability mm. um, aims, and that was even before um, the Max. Although interestingly, with um, uh, with the continued growth of the Max, it's now shelved plans to um, operate its uh, Irish transatlantic yes, flights, yeah. um, which would they, which will stop later this month. So, mm. or would have been resumed. Um, so, you're seeing that area. Then one other market, which I'd also just mentioned, which I just think is really interesting, I was just looking at this this morning, which is India, mm. the Indian domestic market. Now, that has grown at, that's the fastest growing market over mm. recent years. Last year, that grew, uh, seat capacity last September was up 17, 18%. Mm. And um, obviously, with Jet Airways um, uh, collapsing, and that's been grounded since March, and uh, April, March, April, I think it was, uh, and so far, efforts to restore it haven't come to anything mm. um, capacity obviously capacity growth in the Indian domestic market has uh, uh, we, there's no double digit growth this year but it's actually mm. flat which shows mm. you know, all that capacity that Jet Airways is flying has been mm. has been taken up albeit you know we, we don't know uh, if Jet Airways re-emerges whether we can reclaim any of that but and that but that has mostly been taken up by, by low cost carriers so sp- you know, uh, SpiceJet, Indigo, GoAir, Vistara, AirAsia, mm. India, all these carriers, low-cost carriers picking up that, that domestic traffic. So even though actually in terms of capacity there's very little movement in mm. India, it's actually, there's quite a shift in, in the types of, of carriers that are, that are flying it. And uh, just one thing as well, that uh, looking at North America when I'm pulling capacity data for airline business, one thing that also shows up compared with Europe is when you look at the, the low-cost carriers in the US, for example, they are seeing double-digit growth um, month, you know, year on year. Mm. So if you look at Spirit, um, Frontier, um, I think that reflects, again, that Europe is a much more mature market in terms of those low-cost carriers, whereas you know, the, the, the low-cost carriers in the US, for example, are a much smaller proportion of that market and in, in Canada as well. So I think it reflects the different levels of opportunity um, within those 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 specific markets absolutely so that's our little state of state of play we'll uh, keep you up to date on, on that in um, the months to come um after the break i'll be talking to flight global's singapore bureau chief greg waldron who's been uh, catching up with vietnam airlines airline business will be at the outer leaders forum in brasilia at the end of october you'll be able to keep up with all the news and analysis from the event at flightglobal.com forward slash outer so, Greg, you interviewed the chief executive of Vietnam Airlines for the uh, latest airline business cover interview. Um, tell us a bit about the man. Well, Duarte Tan has a long history in aviation. Uh, he started out in the 80s as an air traffic controller, and he's really seen immense changes both in you know the airline itself as well as you know Vietnam's aviation infrastructure. It went from this big, you know this you know communist country, um, one airline. Um, using Russian equipment, um, very limited links to the outside world, 
And now it's, you know, of course, Vietnam's opened up greatly over those years. And Vietnam Airlines has become a very modern uh, airline and really looking to, like, you know, creating partnerships overseas, how it can expand. And it has a very modern fleet as well. And he's been in charge since uh, 2016 or something like that? Yeah, he's been with the airline for the last three years. But, of course, he served in, you know, many uh, roles before that. Um, but he comes across as a very conservative, you know, cautious um, custodian of the airline. I mean, you know, and he's managing this thing at a great time of change. And he's quite a contrast to the other airline CEOs that you see. For example, Madame Tao, who's the CEO of Vietjet. Mm-hmm. And she's quite a flamboyant, um, quite a, you know, outspoken, quite a different type of character. And kind of fitting that low-cost carrier model, I guess, in the old-school um, Michael O'Leary, Herb Kelleher kind of larger than life way, I suppose. Yeah, precisely. She's kind of like a Tony Fernandez mm. and like these other individuals that you've mentioned. She has a character. She has a very distinct um, profile in the Vietnamese community. Um, you know, her demeanor, the way she dresses, you know, the type of, you know, publicity stunts that she does and so forth. So meeting, um, you know, the CEO of Vietnam Airlines, Mr. Duong, was a very, you know, interesting opportunity. You mentioned there about this sort of journey and transition that they're going through because the airline is sort of making i guess that that starting that journey from from state carrier to perhaps being more independently run i suppose well i asked him about this during the interview um you know how much does the government get involved in your day-to-day operations and he told me that you know it's essentially the government has the majority of the seats on the board i think they own about 85 86 percent of the airline is um uh, there's a small amount that's listed on the um the Vietnamese Stock mm-hmm. Exchange. I think it's uh, in Hanoi and in Saigon. You also have, um, it's ANA has a stake in the airline as well. Mm. And so, but still, the airline, the government has a very large seat at the table. But he says that in reality, they're not involved in the day-to-day functioning of the airline, but they do get involved, you know, in the board meetings and that kind of thing. Mm. Um, and also they're involved in the strategic direction as well. So, for example, one of the obligations Vietnam Airlines has um, as a state-owned carrier is operating to airports that maybe they'd prefer not to, mm. you know, servicing in you know, a sort of remote or yes. you know, places like this. And he says that's the advantage that the LCCs have is they don't have to um, bother with these kind of shorter routes. Mm. But he says that, but at, but at the end of the interview, also added, he stressed, look, it's always going to be a state-owned carrier. Mm. Um, the, you know, the government's always going to be involved in some way or another for the foreseeable future, certainly. And you, you mentioned that the partnership with ANA, the Japanese carrier. How is that sort of working out? Are we seeing closer ties between the two airlines? You haven't seen much in that. I think they do some code sharing, but really it's more about developing the processes within Vietnam Airlines. You know, how do you handle things at the hub? How do you, you know, connect flights, that kind of thing? How do you deal with certain situations? So I think the ANA thing is looked more at as a way to increase the professionalism of Vietnam Airlines. Because for years they were, you know, this, you know, basically like the Vietnamese version of Aeroflot, Mm. kind of a communist run airline. Um, old planes, you know, indifferent service, and now, of course, they're competing in a very dynamic yeah. and difficult Asian environment. And it, it's interesting. We talked a bit about infrastructure there, and um, for a long time, Vietnam's um, Category Two safety status blocked it from being able to operate um, the country as a whole. That is, uh, being able to operate to to the US. Mm-hmm. That that they earlier this year, I think, got um, Category One status. And US flights is that sort of an opportunity for the airline? Interestingly, um, just I think I read some news today that they've um, obtained their a, a permit to operate mm. to the USA. But when I spoke to Mr. Duong, he was a bit cautious about the opportunity that the US represents. Mm. Um, there's a few issues with this. For one, um, you know, finding an aircraft that has the performance to do that. So yeah. you may be looking at like triple seven eight or potentially, you know, the version of the A350 that could make it. They have A350 900s, but those would have to make a technical stop in North Asia to Mm. service um, the U.S. West Coast. I mean, L.A. is seen as the key destination, incidentally, because of the large Vietnamese community there. Um, But that said, though, aside from the aircraft performance element, um, he also was a bit dubious about the actual reality of the market, even though it's the largest unserved market in mm. the world, the Vietnam U.S. market. Um, the problem is it tends to be mostly leisure and family travelers. You're not getting a lot of you know, high, high paying business type mm. of traffic. Another problem with the market is um, for Americans to travel to Vietnam, you, know, you have to pay for a visa. It's a bit expensive. It's a bit annoying. Um, it's not something people like mm. to do. 
Um, and then for Vietnamese to go to the States, it's extremely difficult to get a visa to the U.S. Mm. You have to line up at the embassy. It takes forever. They, you know, there's a very good chance you're going to get rejected. So you don't have that demand um, on the Vietnamese mm. side. And I guess the other point he mentioned, too, is that the, um, the big North Asian carriers, um, you know, like basically the carriers in Taiwan, mm. uh, Korea and Japan especially, are very powerful on that U.S., um, Vietnam transit mm. market. So what happens is um, it'd be a very challenging market for him for them to break into. He added also that the Chinese carriers, like China Southern, mm. he's, he's specifically mentioned, um, are also involved in the transit market increasingly too. So yes, it's a big market. Yes, category one is great. Um, but, you know, direct flights, probably not yet. Although they are enhancing their code share with Delta mm. to place their code on Delta Airlines to the states from North Asia, from Japan, oh, okay, which yeah. is significant. I think that's going to come into effect next year. And both this carries Sky Team, of course, so there's a, a, a exist for the partnership around there, I guess, as well. Yeah, there is a synergy. And they've had a partnership with Sky Team for a while where they've actually put, put, put their code onto the um, flights between, you know, uh, Delta flights, mm. you know, uh, from Japan. Mm -hmm. But of course, now you can put the Delta code on Vietnam flights yeah. because of category one. Lastly, I guess, we, and you, you, you mentioned to it earlier, I mean, it's, it's the Vietnam market is, is, is fascinating because mm. there, there is, there is a lot happening there, mm. isn't it? Um, in terms of what's that, what's that competitive landscape like? It's very competitive, and it's only getting more so. Um, the, it's, you can think of it like as a sort of a triangular. The domestic market is like a sort of a triangular trade, if you mm. will. Um, whereas the Vietnam, the Ho Chi Minh City Saigon route to Hanoi is about 40% of all air traffic within the country. And then the other big city in Vietnam, Da Nang, um, that accounts for about 20% of the traffic goes from Ho Chi Minh City to Da Nang. 20% goes from Hanoi to um, Da Nang. Mm. And it's gotten very competitive because you've seen um, you know, airlines like Vietjet rise in the recent years, and they've just put a lot of capacity in the market. You know, tickets are extremely cheap. Um, you know, and, and the people have a real luxury in a sense, too. You can buy the ticket the day before you fly, mm. and it's still just as cheap as it was a month ago. So you kind of wonder about you know, how their yield management mm. actually works. Um, so you have the Vietjet factor, then you have Bamboo Air that's mm. come on steam recently, and that's backed by a very wealthy property developer. As a startup, that is quite a high profile startup, isn't it? There's certainly no shortage of, of backing behind it. Yeah, they were kind of an airline that I was wondering if it would actually take off mm. because they seem to have all these ambitions. You know, they're ordering A321s yeah. from Airbus, they're you know, making commitments for A320s from the leasing companies, they're ordering 787s from Boeing. And um, of course, uh, when they were doing this, there was no real indication that they would get a license. So they'd get a light. They were supposed mm. to get a license, but then that date passed, and they were. And it, the dates keep passing, but eventually they did get a license. Mm. And um, you know, they are operating internally in Vietnam now. Um, apparently, quite a good product, from what I understand. And they can get a meal and so forth. It's still quite cheap. And uh, the reason they were going to order the seven eight sevens was apparently so they could serve Europe mm. and maybe the U.S. There was also a report out that they were even considering getting an A380 <laughs> to serve um, the U.S. market, but I'm not sure how credible that mm. is and whether that would work that well as a business, but that's what I've heard, yeah. Interesting times ahead in that market. Greg, Definitely, thanks yeah. for your time. Great. So that's all for this time. You can find links to the stories we've referenced, including Greg's Vietnam Airlines interview, in the podcast notes. And if you've enjoyed the podcast, please leave a review and don't forget to subscribe to the podcast. We'll be back again in October. In the meantime, you can stay up to date on breaking airline news and analysis at flightglobal.com. See you next time.